Are you ready? Okay. I'm good. <laughs> good afternoon. I'm Terry Trout, your council chairperson, I'm representing the uh, council and the council education committee tonight to kind of kick us off and get us started. Um, the intent of <clears throat> this is an informational session. It is not by any means intended to persuade you to one side or the other or whatever issue is to give you information as to what council has come up with an education plan so that we educate both sides of the issues that we're dealing with today. Before we start, uh, would you join me in a word of prayer, please? Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to come together as a church. We are one body, Lord. We ask that you have, and you give us open hearts, open minds, open souls to just understand what's going on with our world and make sure that we can get along with each other, make sure that we understand while other people have different views, we're still one body, we're still one Christ, we're still following you, Lord. So give us that direction, that guidance, so that we might do your will and that Bethel may remain as strong as it always has been. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Okay, just an introduction before we get started with uh, our slide showing um, there will be some other people joining me as well that are on that education committee. Bethel's been around for a long time. So best as I calculated off the website, it was somewhere over 165 plus years that Bethel has been a church of some sort. You know, we've lost a lot of active members, passive members, through passing, through people moving, through people going in and out. But we've also gained a lot of passive and active members as well. And I say passive, and those are the people that actually do something, but we maybe don't see all the time. But they're there for us in prayer, they're there for us in support, they're there doing the things that maybe we just don't see, whereas other people may be more active. You know, when we gained uh, those members, a lot of those members came from different denominations, backgrounds, training, and with that became dis different disciplines that they may have been exposed to in Bible training. So we need to understand that Bethel is a diverse church, and that is a good thing. That's not a bad thing. We have a wide variety of views. We have a, a lot of influence within Spartanburg. We are a church that everybody looks to. We're the church up on the hill at the end of Main Street, basically. So in saying that, the United Methodist Church, as we are, we have a book of discipline. That is what our pastors are taught, ordained by, and that's what we follow. Basically, teachings, doctrines, and disciplines. And there lies the problem. There are outside conferences outside of the South Carolina Conference that have violated the Book of Discipline. Basically, they have gone outside of those things, and it's causing us angst within our churches, within South Carolina. Our bishop recognized that, and it was causing angst amongst our our member churches. We also know that General Conference hasn't met because of COVID and other reasons for several years now, and there were, there were proposals put on tables. And we went from one side of an issue to the other side of the issue. So he gave us an opportunity to, to have a separation if we couldn't live with what we have right now and if we think what's foreseeing is gonna be a conflict within our church. So he gave us that out, so to speak. And he did so by introducing, the, using a paragraph that everybody's probably familiar with that is basically based on closing of the church. So, as we met at a council in January of this year and kind of took everything in front of us, it was voted by the council that we didn't really have enough information at the time that we would wait until general conference 2024 before we made any kind of decision. Since then, we've had a council meeting September 25th and pretty much reinforced that same decision. There was a lot of discussion, maybe some people changed their minds, but the majority still thought that the best thing for us to do from a council perspective was to wait until general conference to make any kind of decision. And that's kind of where we are right now. But in the meantime, we knew there, there was a lot of conversations going on. There were some groups meeting. There were things happening and whatnot. The people were getting information. And there's all kinds of information out there. There's true information out there. There are, there are information on articles that are somewhat misleading if you take it from the author's point of view. 
all that arose to some conflict. All that arose to some confusion. So we appointed a council education committee comprised of different backgrounds, different views, and what we're presenting today is what that committee came up with. There were nine people on that committee. That committee met for four, five, six times total. They came up with the slides that you're about to see right now, and they came up with a plan for us to present it right here for you today so that you would understand what is going on and what are the options for us at this particular point in time. So I'm going to call on Philip to give us a little bit of history about what's happening. All right, so since I'm a historian, you get the short, very short history lesson for me. Uh, while disagreements over theology and the direction of the denomination have been ongoing for decades, the primary source of controversy in the United Methodist Church at present relates to human sexuality. Since 1972, the United Methodist Book of Discipline has called the practice of homosexuality incompatible with Christian teaching. The book, of the book of Discipline does not allow same-sex marriages to be conducted by United Methodist clergy, and it does not allow for the ordination or, of gay or lesbian individuals. Since 1972, however, individual Methodists and Methodist groups have worked to change that language or to remove that language on human sexuality. In more recent years, some United Methodist clergy have celebrated same-sex marriage despite the fact that those are not authorized. And some clergy, in, that, in those cases, clergy have been brought up on charges. They have been tried, and some have been convicted by juries of their peers. Some have been acquitted. Some clergy have come out as gay or lesbian to their bishops. Some of those have faced charges. Some of those have been convicted and some acquitted. More recently, some annual conferences, and annual conferences control, the clergy session of an annual conference generally is responsible for the interviewing and elect recommendation of clergy for ordination. Um, some annual conference clergy sessions have chosen to ignore that provision, and some annual conferences have ordained gay and lesbian Methodists to the clergy. In 2016, the denomination's Western Jurisdictional Conference elected a married gay woman to serve as a bishop, and she was assigned to be a bishop of an annual conference. And there was litigation over that, and the Judicial Council basically said they didn't have any jurisdiction over that, sort of. Um, so, in 2024, the General Conference, which is the top legislative body for the entire denomination, will again consider petitions to change the rules on ordination and marriage. It, it will actually more likely will consider rules to actually change the structure of the church, to change the structure of the denomination that will allow different geographic regions to uh, uh, respond to their local context. In South Carolina, our Bishop Jonathan Holston has affirmed that he has upheld the rules in the Book of Discipline. In the South Carolina Conference, there are no appointed openly gay clergy and no same-sex marriages that I'm aware of are being performed. In the past year, annual conferences throughout the United States have used language, temporary language in the Book of Discipline to allow churches who disagree with the church's doctrines on human sexuality to disaffiliate, although the official position of the nom denomination has not changed. In South Carolina, using a different paragraph, using paragraph 2549, the paragraph that allows a local church to close, 113 local churches separated from the United Methodist Church this summer. Each of those churches had their own reasons for making that choice, and each followed the plan developed by the South Carolina Annual Conference. The trustees and the bishop and cabinet allowed for that separation. So what we have now, the two of my friends on our committee will present just the slides, the PowerPoint slides from what the committee worked on this, um, this, this fall.
Hi, I'm Becky Griffith. Um, why now? Why are we doing this now? Well, we're concerned about the health and future of our church. Um, we're concerned about the uncertainty it, that's causing harm to our church. Conflict is hurting our witness to others. It's disrupting the missions and ministries of the church. It's causing fear and confusion in the body of Christ. It's distracting the focus of the church. We've lost our unity. Um, the effect on membership and contributions is of concern. And tensions are rising somewhat. I'm Bill Dobbins. Um, the, uh, what we're looking at on this page are the key issues that have been uh, alluded to or mentioned earlier. Key issues for the United Methodist Church currently are uneven adherence to the Book of Discipline. And as Philip mentioned, uh, that this has happened in other areas, has not happened in South Carolina. Uh, Same-sex marriage, whether or not that should be allowed to occur in the uh, Methodist churches and ordination of LGBTQ persons, whether or not they should be uh, ordinated. The, uh, there are three groups with different per, uh, perspectives that Becky's gonna talk about in a minute, but those three groups are traditionalists, centrists, and progressives. Um. We tried to list some of the um, theological and maybe doctrinal differences of these three groups. Um, so we'll just go through. Uh, the first group we'll talk about is the traditionalists. The traditionalists believe that the Bible is the inspired, unchanging word of God, the foundation of reason, tradition, and experience. Traditionalists, traditionalists believe homosexual behavior is a sin. Traditionalists believe the Bible is the authority of truth, context is important to discernment. Traditionists believe all are sinners and can transform to be more Christ-like. All are welcome. Traditionalist thought does not allow the ordination of practicing LGBTQ persons. Traditionalists believe members of the church are called into loving accountability, and traditionalists believe that Christian marriage is between a man and a woman. Okay, we're going to skip over to the far right, to the progressives. Um, progressives believe scripture must always be read in context and light of reason, tradition, and experience. Progressives believe homosexual behavior is not a sin. Progressives believe the Bible is open to new revelations. Progressives believe in the inclusion of persons who are LGBTQ, all are welcome. Progressives would allow for the ordination of practicing LGBTQ persons, and progressives would allow same-sex marriages. Okay, in the middle, you have the centrist. Um, centrist thinking accepts both traditional and progressive views. Uh, Centrist thinking accepts marriage and ordination of LGBTQ persons, but does not require it. Centrist thinking believes each church and pastor should be allowed to make their own decisions. And centrist may lean toward traditionalist beliefs, or they may lean toward progressive thinking. And also, a lot of centrists are questioning what do they really believe. They're not sure. Our council, when we began meeting on this, uh, found ourselves with two, basic, two options. Uh, the first option was to uh, exercise paragraph 25 49 of the Book of Discipline, and that there are several uh, rules that we would have to follow if we exercise that option. This would be the option to vote for a disaffiliation. The uh, church body, which in our case is the um, church council, 
uh, would have to determine if it was in the best interest to allow the church to pursue separation. The, uh, in order, if we did that, if we decided to pursue that, we would have to have a 30-day dis discernment process. And currently, that, what, what that would mean is that we would have to begin, uh, as the, the rules are now, that we would have to begin in, uh, on January 1st of 2023, and we would have to uh, decide uh, to have a vote uh, sometime before March the uh, 1st, so we'd have to have a 30-day discernment process that would have to begin sometime after the 1st of, uh, 1st of January and then give us time to have a vote by, by uh, March the 1st. We would have to determine the financial viability of the church. Uh, in order to do that, the church would have to get a, an appraisal of the property and uh, that's what the, the financial uh, viability would mean. And we'd have to pay a 10% amount of the value of the property in order to leave the conference. The church would have to uh, assume its current debt, uh, any, any legal obligations, and then there would have to be a, uh, the vote would have to be at least a two thirds vote of the congregation to disaffiliate. And then once that, all these steps were met, then the approval uh, would, have, would uh, you'd have to apply to the conference for approval and that would be done in the June next year, June 2024 uh, conference. The second option was what well, would be to wait until the general conference of 2024. Uh, and we, the, there are several options that are, that the general conference has and maybe even more by then uh, on consideration which may allow churches to leave the conference if, if they voted to do this with, to leave the conference uh, without a payment uh, as the current rules are requiring the payment. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen until 2024. The, um, and it could be even longer than that if the 2024 conference does not make a decision as to whether or not to change the book of discipline. That's the whole key issue, whether or not the book of discipline, uh, or the main key issue, is whether or not the book of discipline would be changed to allow um, homosexual, uh, uh, homosexuals to be married in the church and whether or not they would allow LGBTQ uh, individuals to be uh, ordinated. People in it, Terry wanted to know that the two-thirds vote of the congregation was the people who voted. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and that's, that's, on, that's on this page, yeah. Uh, so moving on, on to the next page, which is a, once we can see it, is a uh, kind of a breakdown to give you a, uh, those of you who are visual learners, like me, uh, be able to sort of look at what I just said uh, in a visual uh, type. The, uh, beginning the process of discernment, at this time the church council has voted to wait until a 2024 general conference to begin this process. If you don't like the fact that we waited, you can certainly talk with council members about this uh, and the council member, uh, can, uh, um, as, as Terry said, the council voted again to wait, uh, but that could be, could be changed if enough members wanted that changed. The 30-day um, minimum discernment process would have to occur, as I said, uh, have to be sometime um, between January 1st, 2024 and um, uh, March the 1st, or would have to begin before that time so that we would make a decision and vote before March the 1st. Finance Committee would obtain an appraisal of the property and then a vote would have to be, uh, as I said, completed by March the 1st. Two thirds of the people, of the members who voted, not the entire membership, but just the people who voted that particular day. The way that would happen, uh, our district superintendent would come to a meeting that we, that we had and would be there to verify that everyone who voted uh, during that process was a member. 
I'm sorry, what? District superintendent would conduct, yeah, I'm, that's right. The district superintendent would conduct the meeting. That's uh, Kathy Mitchell, who our district superintendent is. Okay, if that happens, uh, if, we have, if we do have the vote, and the vote is, to, is less than two thirds, then Bethel would remain a part of United Methodist Church. And what that would mean is you drop down there, is that we would uh, continue uh, paying our annual apportionments to the South Carolina Annual Conference. Uh, clergy would continue to be appointed by the bishop as it is now. Uh, we would uh, agree with and follow the, the UMC Book of Discipline. And then uh, whatever changes might occur in the, uh, in the 2024 annual conference, we would abide by those changes. If, however, we did have the vote and the vote was more than two thirds of the membership who voted, the uh, financial obligation to leave the church would have to be uh, fulfilled to the annual conference. That would mean we have to pay the current and next year's apportionment. We have to pay 10% of the value of the assets um, and we would have a, um, Bethel would become a, a new church, uh, and a new church would need to be established, and that new, uh, and with we form a new corporate, that we form a new corporation, Bethel would have formed a new corporation, and we, they would have to, we'd have to remove all United Methodist Church symbols to take that, take that away. And if, Following on down, if that if that did happen, the vote was more than two thirds. There would be a couple of options for Bethel at that point in time. Uh, the option on the left there is to would be to join another denomination. Uh, currently, uh, such as the Global United Methodist, oh, not United Methodist, but Global Methodist Church, which is, uh, a lot of the churches who left that Philip mentioned did join the Global Methodist Church. You would adopt that Methodist Church Book of Discipline uh, and go by the rules of the government, governance. You would have new, new clergy uh, with a different uh, connectional ministry. Or another option would be just to remain independent, not join a, uh, the Global Methodist Church or, or any other uh, denomination create your own book of discipline, you could create new policies and procedure, you'd hire all clergy and staff uh, and no apportionments as, as we have would have currently. No appointments. Hmm? You wouldn't have ministers appointed. That's right. right. I'm not apportionment, but that's correct. Appointments. Yeah. Uh, and then if that if that did happen, everyone would have the opportunity to have the voice heard, their voice heard, members of the who feel strongly opposed to what the outcome would be, might leave or could leave, uh, but, but the frustration of not knowing what will happen uh, would end with the, with the vote. Thank you. So where we're at right now is what you're seeing up here is just a timeline, kind of follows what uh, Dr. Stone uh, did earlier. And this will be on the church website as well too. We decided to wait until we actually got in front of the congregation to do this education uh, process right now before we put it out on the website and everybody said, what the heck is that, right? So, so there is an appendix here and there's also an appendix just to let you reference the current uh, United Methodist Book of Discipline uh, regarding the inclusiveness, human sexuality, marriage, and ordination of ministers. So just to kind of reference for you. So at this point right now, we're kind of at a stage that we are kind of waiting in, on general conference, but we know that there are other people out there that maybe have not been in connection with council members. Maybe they think differently. Maybe there's some other things that we need to talk about and have their voice. So I'm going to call Brad up here um, 
because one of the things we've been working on is let everybody be heard and what we think was some of the best ideas is to do an individual survey and it will require you to validate who you are but it will be kept confidential as far as your response that means that you have to have a valid email to basically participate in this but at the same time it's not going to tell who said what if you want to tell people how you feel perfectly fine no problem if you want to remain in confidence perfectly fine as well too so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Brad talk about what we're going to do and then we'll backtrack and, and open it up for any questions that we have. So I want to first start by thanking Joe Locke for helping with this and, and helping to put this kind of uh, survey before us. I want to be very clear with you, this is not a straw poll. <laughs> Okay, so this is a non-binding. There's nothing that is going to come from this uh, survey that we're going to put out there. Don't put it up quite yet. Not, just a little wait. Um, <laughs> so we're going to put it on a QR code that will be up here. I've got individual sheets that I can give to you as you leave. Um, it will also post it on our website. Uh, I will probably email it so that you can follow a link to it to fill it out on a computer. Because it's probably pretty easier, a little bit easier to do on a computer than it is to do with your little phone. So... Um, we are going to put it up there just in case you want to pop it and save it. As Terry said, we are going to ask for a name and an email address. That is simply so that our church secretary can make sure that all of the responses are valid as well as people aren't filling out more than one. Not that you would do that, but we just want to cover all of our bases. Okay? So... We will not publish any of your information that you answer uh, with your name attached to it. What will be created, um, because we're doing it through Google Forms, are some really good uh, pie charts and other kind of neat ways in which to look at this data. The next step, once this is done, and we'll probably leave it open for a week or two uh, in order to give people an ample opportunity that information then will be shared with the church council. The church council is the ones who have to make this decision for the body of the church in order to enter into the process, and we want the church council to have as much data and information as they can in order to make the best decision for, our con for your congregation here at Bethel. Uh, so that will be um, put up here towards the end, I think, uh, of, of our time together. Again, I also have sheets that you are more than welcome. I only printed about 30 of them, so that if you want to take them as a couple or, or whatever, we can do that. Um, but this information is going to be dispersed. I don't know that we'll post it on our website because if we do that, then anybody and everybody can get on there. But I think we'll send it out some kind of transmission uh, via email. The other folks who do not do email, who we are aware of, so some of our shut-ins may want to have a voice as well. And so we're working on a way in which to get them some of these uh, surveys so that they could fill them out by hand. And what we'll do is Shannon will then input that information for us in so that all of it is in the same space. Okay? So I just wanted you to know that this was coming, and this is kind of our one way in which we're hoping to be able to find out a little bit more information about the life of the church. We know people are split. We talk to everybody. We know the situation that is out there, but we want to try and get some kind of concrete data in front of our church council so that they can make the best decision. In addition to that, very soon, later this week, we are going to set up online registration for our Courageous Conversations. That will take place in the month of November. So in the month of November, there will be three Sundays and three Wednesdays back to back that you will be invited to sign up and simply to come between 6.30, I think we said 6.30 and 8 on Wednesday nights and 5 to 6.30 on Sunday nights if you choose to enter into a conversation with others. Um, we will do our best to try and put uh, groups together, small groups, so that you will be able to have conversation, and it's not 25 people in the same room shouting at each other, but instead to get to know each other. Some of these courageous conversations will be about what you love about the church and what your hopes and dreams are for the church, but it will also talk about the future of the church. We um, are going to use, there is some 
um, curriculum that's already out there that we are going to adapt time-wise. We simply just wanted it to be about three weeks because we know people's time is valuable and we do need to have multiple meetings in order for you to establish some kind of trust with each other so that these conversations can take place. Again, this is an option for you. None of this stuff is concrete that you have to do it in order to vote or anything like that down the road. None of that is, is the requirement. We simply want to try and facilitate dialogue amongst the congregation because we know you love each other. We know that this is an issue and this whole um, uh, season of the United Methodist Church has caused a lot of heartache and heartburn and we're trying to do our best in order to bridge some of those gaps that exist. Okay, so those are the two things. So the survey that will go up um, as well as um, an opportunity for you to engage in some small group conversations should you choose to do that. So, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I won't go far. Okay. <laughs> So right now, what we'd like to do is just open up for questions that you may have to <clears throat> any council member that may be here, or um, right here, my education committee, I should have probably recognized them here. Most of them are sitting right here in this front row with me. And maybe you want to ask how we came about some of this. Maybe you want to ask a question that wasn't up here, uh, whatever. So I'm just going to open up the floor right now for anybody that has any questions regarding what's happening right now or what's going on in the grand scheme of things. And it may be somebody in the congregation that has a response to that too as well. Hang on just a second. Is this on? question is, uh, if we as a church uh, don't meet milestones in making decisions on time going through this process, what is the default situation? So if we don't, what do you mean if by milestones? If we don't do anything, if we just continue. So once the current direction of council is right now, is once general conference happens in 2024, it now becomes we do something after we find out what 20, uh, 2020, the general conference would hold for us. So our pathway right now is, is just to stay doing what we're doing until general conference meets, and after that then we'll determine what direction we need to go from there. Does that make sense? He's got right there. Any other questions? Silent bunch. You all did a good job. You do. We're we're live streaming, so you have to put a mic. We got you. Got to have the microphone. <laughs> what is the date of general conference? What's the date of general conference? April the yeah end of April into early May. I want to say it's like April twentieth until May the fourth or fifth. It's normally about fourteen days. Yeah. So it's late April, early May. Any others? If not, I want to express my appreciation for the education group as well as council who went through this meticulously to try to show what sides and what they represent in their beliefs and as well as because I know there's a lot of information out there. There's probably a lot of more information that will come as well too, but I want to thank these guys in the front row right here that spent their time spent uh, typically about a whole month and a half of coming up with this so that council could approve. So thank you very much on behalf of council and behalf of Bethel United Methodist Church. Yeah, awesome. Thank yeah, you. thank you. You want to pray us out? And yeah. I will leave. Well, let, let's, let's, um, 
let's put Megan to work. Why don't you pray for okay. us? Okay. Where is I'm running around here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's pray together. God, you are good beyond every measure that we have. And you pour grace out upon each and every one of us more than we deserve. We thank you for the work of this committee and really the work of this church for all the ways that they are being faithful um, to who you have called them to be. God, as we enter into discussions with one another, as we think and pray over answers to surveys, we ask that your spirit would continually guide us that in every person that we encounter, we would see your face and know your love. Be with us as Bethel. Keep God putting us on a path where we can witness to your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Go in peace.